Hello and welcome. To talk about Prime Minister Narendra Modi's big visit to the United States next week, we're joined on India Today's news track at this moment, live from Washington, D.C., by India's most experienced diplomat when it comes to American affairs. Last time, the Prime Minister went to uh, New York and D.C. Uh, India's now ambassador, Taranjit Singh Sandhu, at that time was the deputy chief of mission at the Embassy of India in Washington, D.C. Before this, he's been First Secretary Political uh, at the Washington Embassy. That's from 1997 to 2000 when he tracked the U.S. Congress for India. And he's also been at the permanent mission of India at the United Nations. So he's really served in different capacities and seen this relationship between India and the United States evolve over the decades. Uh, Ambassador Taranjit Singh Sandhu, welcome to India today and thank you so much for your time. It's a massively busy time for, for you, so I can quite imagine how rushed you are. Appreciate you making time for us. Thank you, Rahul. And I, of course, remember you very much from 2014 visit outside Mahatma Gandhi's monument, just outside the embassy, and you were doing a live show then. Oh, great. Fantastic. And we're looking forward to seeing you in D.C. Uh, very soon. I want to start by asking you, Ambassador Sandhu, about the significance of this visit. And your point of view is important because you've seen past visits as well. You've been involved very closely in organizing Prime Minister Narendra Modi's previous visits to uh, Washington and New York. As somebody who's been on the inside, you know, what's your sense of how and why this visit is special and why is it different from the previous times that Prime Minister Modi has been in the United States. So Rahul, uh, you are absolutely right. Uh, Prime Minister has visited the United States on multiple times in the past uh, nine years. And each visit has been special. As you have seen, the character and the depth of every visit has had a special aspect. But this indeed uh, stands out. It is uh, historic and it's historic in many ways and I'm not just using it, the expression just to utilize it, but you know it's a state visit and state visit is a highest expression of friendly relations between any two countries and especially in the United States it's not common and it's indeed an honor for India and for our Prime Minister. And Prime Minister Modi is only the third Indian leader to have been invited for a state visit since last 75 years, meaning since our independence. And in fact, when he addresses the US Congress for the second time, he will become the only Indian leader so far to address the US Congress twice. Uh, besides uh, leading iconic figures like Nelson Mandela, Winston Churchill, just a very few of them. So this visit indeed is significant ceremonial wise as well as in substantial outcomes. You've been speaking to many senior officials in the Biden administration. And President Biden, since he came to power, hasn't done too many uh, state visits. This is only the third, the South Korean president, uh, Vladimir Volensky, and then the Prime Minister of India. So the significance of the state visit, not just in a 75-year context, but in the context of the Biden administration, and what's your sense of why the government in Washington, D.C. at this moment seems to be laying out the red carpet for Prime Minister Modi and for India? Rahul, I think the message is loud and clear. United States and India are taking the partnership to a higher orbit. I think the visit is an escalation of our partnership and it actually is going to transform. You know, we have had a relationship with United States, uh, especially since the late 90s, but broadly it has been a kind of a buyer-seller market. But this time it's going to go in a different level of partnership. And I'm sure I'll 
get an opportunity to come to that. But in this aspect, especially in the last two years, if you have seen the engagements uh, between President Biden and Prime Minister Modi, it's there to see for everyone. However, I must add here that President Biden, when he was a senator, way back in 90s, in fact, had laid his bet on India, if I may use the American terminology. And none other than Secretary of State Lincoln confirmed it just a few days back, because Lincoln was his staffer on the Hill at that time. And that has continued. If you take a look, when Prime Minister Modi came in 2014, and you will recall at that time, uh, Vice President Biden had hosted a lunch for him. In 2016, he participated, he in fact presided over the joint session of U.S. Congress. So, in a sense, this has been an escalation, but just look at this just last one month. You have had Secretary, Defense Secretary Austin in Delhi, you have had National Security Advisor Sullivan there, you have seen Foreign Secretary Quatra here. There have been tangible outcomes. And that's why when I told you that on the substantive part, look at the ICET launch. You know, technology is becoming the key. And technology is only shared if you have confidence and trust between two countries. That's why when I said the level is reaching much higher. There is trust, trust and confidence between So you mentioned inside. a few things. I want to take them one by one. Uh, you mentioned the initiative on critical and emerging technologies. We've been hearing a lot about this in the last year or so. But people who are watching you at this time would wonder, what is the actual takeaway? There's been a lot of talk between the two countries on uh, critical and emerging technologies. But what does this mean in the real world? What does India get now from the United States, uh, which it didn't have access to technologically earlier? So Rahul, as I said, we certainly need to take a bigger picture and have a clear idea on what's happening in this relationship. It's not called the most consequential partnership just for nothing. Let me tell you some concrete areas in which cooperation is happening. Let's start with healthcare. You know, healthcare cooperation today has deepened very much and especially during the COVID time. When we talk of healthcare, keep in mind affordable healthcare, affordable medicines, affordable vaccines. You may be surprised that 50% of generic drugs in the United States are actually produced by Indian companies. So if you go to a pharmacy in the United States and ask for a paracetamol, something which very ordinary people use, you will see made in India. That's the kind of penetration. Sim similarly, go for vaccines. You know, look at the rotavirus. Look at the latest uh, vaccine on COVID, Corvavax. You know, these, the cost of these from $60 have come down to $1 after bulk production is being done in India. And it also creates jobs and capacity in India. So similarly, if we come to IT, digital, innovation, startup energy, etc. This basket, and I will come to ICET specifically. Again, there is a whole lot of synergy here. Look at the energy basket. Within energy, you have renewables, solar. In fact, one of the biggest solar production is being set up in Tamil Nadu by First Solar, and that is being financed by DFC. There are so many examples. Look at the iPhones, etc., etc. And also, the fourth, education and knowledge partnership. I'm sure we'll get a chance to get to that. But do keep in mind, there are 200,000 Indian students here, two-thirds of them in STEM areas. They bring value and competitive edge to the United States. And finally, the defense and strategic side. So just taking a minute and talking about what you mentioned, I said. Now, I said includes quantum, AI, defense innovation, space, telecommunications, 5G, 6G, semiconductors. 
you know, all these areas are going to be covered. And when we talk even of semiconductors, you may be a bit surprised that semiconductors also require a huge trained manpower. And India today has the youngest manpower in the world. So I've touched a few. I want to underline to you that this has indeed become a substantial relationship. In the build-up to this visit, there's been a lot of focus on defense purchases. In the past several decades, India has relied heavily on buying weapon systems from Russia and before that the USSR and the advantage with buying from the Soviet Republic was that it came not just as a transaction but it came with a substantial component of transfer of technology. Uh, people wondering would, uh, people watching would wonder whether the purchase of a GE F414 engine uh, for the light combat aircraft in India, there's been talk about the Predator deal, if that is officially announced. Will all of this be as a purely commercial transaction? Because The Economist magazine in this week's cover describes the India-US relationship as the world's biggest transaction. Is it a transaction or is it actually at a good competitive rate involving a component of transfer of technology which really ups India's defense capabilities? So, I'm not going to comment on what X, Y, Z say. Let's talk of facts. And here, in fact, this is one area which very clearly points to the transformation of relationship. You know, earlier it was a kind of a buyer-seller, a kind of a market-oriented relationship. Today, it has gone much deeper. And that's where say that this transformation is of a different level. So today we are talking of co-development, co-manufacturing, co-creation. I don't want to go into specifics right now because once the visit is there and the outcome document is there, you will see it. But it is indeed important that the kind of areas and you have to only listen to what uh, Jake Sullivan has said in Delhi and what he has been saying. I think one of the most significant aspects of this is that there is enhanced trust and confidence. And I told you that technology, technology will not be shared if there is no trust and confidence between the two countries. And this certainly goes beyond what has been the traditional relationship. I mean, beyond the constituencies, beyond the people. In fact, United States and India, when we say are working on ICET, there are indeed tangible outcomes. And as I again pointed out to you, that look at the scientific R&D, and this visit you will see. You will see that both the leaders will be focusing and showing on that. So quantum, AI, defense innovation, space, advanced telecom, etc. You know, all of them have been touched upon. And therefore, even when we look at, for example, some of the elements of ICED, uh, like semiconductors, you know there is a CHIPS Act in United States. There is a semiconductor mission in India. The semiconductor mission has actually tied up with the number of research institutions in the United States. So again, I will bring it back that the tech partnership, United States is a tech powerhouse. I don't think I need to elaborate on that. It's very, very visible. And India is certainly an emerging tech power. And the cooperation and collaboration between the two is very natural. And it has been powered by trust. Ambassador Sandhu, for some of these high-tech deals to go through, not just does India need the Biden administration on board, the U.S. congressional view matters as well. And we've already seen, even in an alliance like the AUKUS, uh, the Australia-UK U.S. nuclear submarine deal got held up uh, because of a congressional review, because of the Arms Export Control Act. Now take, for example, the GE F414 jet engine deal. How confident are you by speaking to members uh, in the Congress uh, that India will be able to get support 
to get these deals through that it's not just the announcement but the announcement will also be followed by the backing of the US Congress which will allow for these deals to be operationalized so Rahul you are talking to someone who actually started his career in the United States in the US Congress and look the doomsday scenario from the 90s from the days Burton amendment used to be put in and etc etc you know everyone used to be talking about that and in a different way look where we have come you know I used to be fighting the Burton amendment on the floor at that time and today we have a situation when the Prime Minister of India has been invited the second time and he actually joins a club of very few look at the facts and that letter of invitation was bipartisan it was actually signed the day after there was a huge vote on the US Congress and I don't want to go into that domestic part look how India united all the four leaders to come together and look at the letter look at the warmth that was expressed so I am talking of facts I am not saying the challenges don't come in any democratic polity the challenges come but I think there is a clear expression look at the way congressmen and senators are coming out and welcoming Prime Minister Modi in fact his invite to come to the hill and speak also indicates that there is a lot of interest in the India story people are very very keen to listen to him and what you are saying whatever comes we will certainly face it and it will go well I think expression on the hill for having the Prime Minister come there and speak to them itself is reflected that there is a bipartisan support across the aisles in the US Congress And that's very reassuring to hear and that would be very useful in the future as well. There are of course topics which are of interest to uh, people at a macro level and a more micro level. Many of our viewers would be interested in the status of visas, work visas uh, like the H-1B visa in the United States for Indian professionals. Is that at all on the agenda? Also the waiting time to get American visas for Indian citizens traveling for different purposes to the U.S. So is there an effort to try, I spoke to the Indian, I spoke to the U.S. ambassador in India, Eric Garcetti, and he said it's a key priority for the Biden administration and for him personally to try and reduce these periods. But is that at all uh, something which is coming up for discussion at an official level? So uh, I was about to say that this is a question for my good friend Eric Garcetti there, but you already, I know you asked him during the interview. In fact, you know, during the visa crisis, I used to often tell my American friends here that the people in India, the young in India who are actually asking for visas are the best friends of the United States. So therefore, whatever can be done to facilitate that should be done. I believe that during this visit, a number of initiatives are definitely up for discussions and also for implementation. And I'm sure Eric has spoken to you about it, but I do want to also take this opportunity to mention to you that there is a huge interest in U.S. universities about collaborating and tying up with Indian institutions. And this is not, I just mentioned to you that there are 200,000 Indian students here, two-thirds of them in STEM areas. Similarly, there is more desire to have Indian students. But I am not only talking about Indian students. Under the new education policy, there is much more increased interest in actually having campus-to-campus -campus relations with Indian universities, having intertwining of degrees, having joint research work, etc., etc. And that all is being made possible by the new education policy. And therefore, I think this aspect of connecting the young on both the sides is very important and very critical. That would be very interesting for top American universities to have joint degrees or to set up campuses. So far, 
uh, that hasn't really happened uh, because you're also speaking to a lot of these educational institutes. Are you seeing interest amongst these institutions to want to come and set up a campus or to have a joint degree because that could be a big game changer in a country like India which requires more institutes of higher learning uh, of a global standard? Absolutely. And uh, Rahul, as I said, it's very good to have Indian students coming. And you know, the Indian Americans have done so well here. During the COVID, you had to own any television station and you would see an Indian origin doctor talking about COVID and what to do. So definitely the professionals here, the four million of them have done exceedingly well. But we are looking at now creating those facilities in India. And under the new education policy, there is a great opportunity to do that. There is much excitement in the Indian, in, in the U.S. universities here. As I mentioned, I've spoken to almost 180 presidents and chancellors of universities. And we are in close touch with our education ministry, with the UGC, with a number of other institutions. You know, look, the top league, that is the IITs, will find their way to the top league here. But we are also looking at connecting tier two and tier three city institutions and universities. Because I strongly believe that the engineers and professionals there also have a lot of flexibility of mind. And we have been underlining that to many of the industry and multinationals here, that they do need to reach out there. So skill development is going to be an important focus during this visit. Let's spend a moment, sir, on the business component of this visit. Prime Minister Modi will be meeting a lot of the top American CEOs as well. Could you give us a status check of where talks on the Indo-US free trade agreement are at this moment and in your conversations with American corporates the kind of interest that you're seeing in wanting to be a part of the India story especially in line in the context of China uh, flexing its muscles and a lot of these companies looking at a China plus one uh, supply chain strategy so they're not entirely dependent on China uh, for their production. So Rahul there are a number of aspects you have touched here but let me start from the back. You spoke about resilient supply chains. It's a very important uh, concern here. And India is certainly being looked at one of those uh, partners who can be important uh, supply chain. Uh, In fact, you know, during the height of COVID, and this may surprise you a bit, the way our handloom industry progressed, the way the production of masks was done, actually in late 2020, I got a request from the city of Philadelphia asking for 3 million masks. And, you know, we were in a position to actually provide them. So that's the kind of uh, uh, cooperation which has been happening. But, you know, coming down to the business part and the trade part, which you pointed out, look, right now, even in the times when we do not have an FDA, when we are coming out of COVID, that is the world is reeling under that pressure, United States especially, even then we have reached the record figure of 190 billion trade and plus. But this is only tip of the iceberg and I completely agree with you. And when I mentioned to you, when I pointed out those five areas, healthcare, technology, IT, digital, you know, and in energy, in education knowledge partnership and defense and strategic affairs. Look, the scope is huge. And that's why this particular visit is going to be a landmark visit. You will see the number of interactions. In fact, you asked me about CEOs. I'm going to avoid giving specific names, but I can tell you that between the different engagements of the Prime Minister, uh, starting with even the state banquet and the state lunch which the Vice President will be hosting and his interaction with the professionals, his one-on-one -on -one meetings, there is going to be ample opportunity where he's going to be interacting with the topmost CEOs. That 
will be an expression of interest in India. In fact, every day if you look at the social media, you see some top American industrialist or company visiting India and even calling on the Prime Minister. So this aspect is one side. But mm -hmm. there is also something, just one more minute I want to, there is also something uh, silently which is happening. That is in small and medium industry. You know, during this visit, there also will be a touch upon the SBA, which is Small Business Administration here, and our small and business, medium business sec sector in India. They will also be connected. You know, the startup culture, there's so much that can be done. And today, tech enables all that to happen. Well, uh, you know, Manmohan Singh had a path-breaking visit in 2005 when the Indo-US nuclear deal was announced. From what you're saying, it seems this is much more than just a sentence or a paragraph. You seem to be suggesting that this is a full chapter in the deepening Indo-US ties, and we'll track this uh, visit very closely with you in Washington, D.C. Ambassador Taranjit Singh Sandhu for taking out time and joining us on the India Today News Track. Thank you very much, sir. Deeply, deeply appreciate you taking our time in the midst of a very busy schedule. Thank you, Rahul. And I leave it to you, whatever nomenclature you want to give it. But I will tell you this much, that both as far as ceremony is concerned and as far as substance is concerned, you will see the impact. Thank you. Thank you, sir.